All right, welcome in. I'm the Kodiak, and today I'm here to talk about why I thought pre-draft, at least, that Marvin Mims was the second best wide receiver in the class. I know that the draft has already happened. We are very, very far removed from it at this point, almost three full months. So, um, yeah, but yeah, I'm here to talk about why his analytic profile is off the charts. And I'm here to talk about why I think Denver should be very excited about the guy they just got. All right, I know that some people may have PTSD from this guy's older brother, but what's the saying? Scout the player, not their last name. I'm kidding. Nobody says that. Regardless, uh, I really like Marvin Mims. For a lot of wide receivers in this class who the NFL thought were at least worthy of being first or second round picks by nature of capital and investment, but let's just get one thing out of the way. All the guys taken in this class, not named Jackson Smith and Jigba, Quentin Johnston, or Jordan Addison, they're bad bets to hit, historically speaking. Wide receivers drafted from 41 to 100 have an insanely low chance of working out. And Zay Flowers has an insanely low floor and a body type we have never, ever, ever seen work out at the NFL level. And Mingo was literally a blocking wide receiver, so my hopes for him are not high at all either. And I know that Mingo and Flowers did not get taken in the 41 to 100 range, but I'm very, very unconfident in both of their ability to be difference makers for Carolina and Baltimore at the next level. But if there is one guy who is sandwiched between that bucket of second and third round receivers who I think could actually be really good at the NFL level, I think it's Marvin Mims. And I think Mims kind of got glossed over in the scouting process because guys were enamored with Zay Flowers or whatever. He was the flavor of the month. And people are very skeptical of Big 12 wide receivers, which I think is a dumb narrative, but whatever. And late second round capital is not nuts for a wide receiver. This was a pretty good class at the premier positions such as quarterback, edge, and O-line. So late second round capital, it's not nuts, but it doesn't mean nothing. And you throw in the fact that the Broncos had holes littered up and down their lineup, yet they felt compelled to trade up for Mims, in their words, to make sure that he did not get away from them. So before I go into what he did in college, and originally this is going to be why I thought he was the second best wide receiver in this class, Let's start with what he did in high school. I don't really care about guy, what guys do in high school besides what their rivals rating is, and Mims was a four-star. But this stat is just too ridiculous for me to not bring up in this video. So think about high school football across the whole USA. You have uber-competitive states such as California, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Louisiana, Missouri, Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Hawaii, and many others. Texas is a breeding ground for athletes. Football is religion down there, whether it's the Cowboys, Texans, literally all of the college teams, and then you get to the high school level, which is incomprehensible and a level of competition that's absurd for 14 through 18 year olds to go through. So Marvin Mims was not only a good player in high school, he has the most receiving yards in Texas high school history. And an even more absurd stat is his senior year of 2,626 yards is a national record. I mean, and I don't think it means a lot considering he probably did not play against a single player he's going to be actually going up against on Sundays. And since analyzing wide receivers has become a literal numbers game throughout the past few years with analytical thresholds and teams and the community overall being smarter, he has the second best age-adjusted yards per hour run season since 2017 in Power 5 conferences. By the way, look at the top of this list. If Justin Ross had stayed healthy, league over. He also had the most yards per target of any college wide receiver in the Power 5 since 2017. And between these two stats that I just brought up, look at the names and look at the company he shares these lists with. So Scott Barrett put a thread out there on Twitter and it basically says everything you need regarding Mims to back him up analytically checks out and he smashes. He checks literally all the boxes as far as production. 18 year old breakout, which is in the 97th percentile, 20.1 yards per route, 94th percentile. And to put things into perspective, although CD Lamb and Hollywood Brown were both better prospects, 20.1 yards per route was higher than each of what those two had finished with. 63rd percentile college target share, 46th percentile dominator. Neither of those are ridiculous, but they're solid enough. He has more than enough production to offset that. So I guess even though he has some solid analytics to back up his game, he wasn't a hog. He wasn't commanding targets at a ridiculous rate. And that is understandable. Not only was he going through quarterback changes, he was playing with some other names that are either in the NFL or will be in the NFL in the future. His best season as far as yards per team pass attempt was 2.66. Also very, very, very good. 
Yards per route run is a very sticky metric. Elite prospects usually hover anywhere from 3 to 3.5, and Marvin Mims came in at just below that with 2.95. And he has a lot to offer. In his freshman year and this previous season at Oklahoma, he played out wide on 65% of his snaps. In his sophomore year, he played in the slot on 75% of his snaps. He also has a 9.39 relative athletic score, and it would have been higher, but he's relatively undersized to a traditional X receiver in this league. But his relative athletic score didn't tell us anything we didn't already know. He's not big, he's explosive. And watching him, my player comp for him is a diet Jalen Waddle. If Mims can even become half of what Jalen Waddle is, Denver should be over the moon. He is way more than just a speed guy. And I know people will try to make that argument for every guy who runs less than a 4-4, but trust me, Mims is actually more than just a speed guy. He has some of the most ridiculous production thresholds of anyone to come out in a while. Now that the analytics are out of the way, what do we see when watching him? Well, he can house any ball that's in his hands. He also made some very ridiculous catches, like there was this one against Texas. I highly recommend you check it out, where he literally goes airborne, does a twist to his shoulder, does a twist to his back shoulder in the air, and still manages to get a foot down. There was also one against Texas Tech where he has a defender draped all over him, yet he catches it against the defender's back. While being a pure speed guy like John Ross or Jalen Hyatt, and maybe even Jameson Williams, I mean, come on, one catch in your first 23 career games, that type usually just doesn't do it at the next level. And I didn't see any of that from Mims. I saw way more than just being able to cook defenders with wheels. I saw contested catches, fighting for 50-50 balls, being able to be a chain mover if he does end up playing slot for the Broncos, and he can also return kicks. Return game doesn't really exist in the modern NFL because it's gone from, well, this can be a tool used to turn the tie in any game, to, well, just don't screw up and get the offense on the field. So what does this mean for Marvin Mims in 2023 and beyond? Well, he was Sean Payton's first draft pick with the Broncos. So even though they were stretched very, very thin with capital and resources this offseason, they decided that they were comfortable trading up to get Marvin Mims. And this pretty much puts the nail in the coffin on KJ Handler's time at the Broncos. He really won't be able to do much. He'll definitely get picked up by another team. But this is just more or less a re-roll on the pick. He's been an absolute bust considering his college profile and capital sank into him. And I'm pretty confident in saying that he will not really be anything, KJ Handler that is, um, at least with Denver. Now, he may go somewhere else and he may be what we thought he could be. But yeah, his time in, his time with the Broncos is done. This is kind of an open depth chart. Judy's the one. He established that at the end of last year. And he could finally be the player that they had hoped. But Sutton looked like he was on the up and up in 2019. Torres ACL in 2020 and really has not been the same ever since. Patrick is the 30-year-old wide receiver also coming off an ACL tear. So while I think Patrick is a good player, historical numbers suggest it could take him a little bit to get going again. Now this team has a lot of mouths to feed, including Judy, Sutton, Patrick, Dulcich, now Mims, and potentially Javante Williams and P. Ryan, even though Javante's coming off an ACL return, so he won't smash immediately. But he his presence in return doesn't mean nothing, per se. But it could be difficult to see a lot of production, at least right out of the gate. And Sean Payton is trying to build an offense that's centered around the rushing attack. The way we know this is because they signed McGlinchey and Powers in free agency, two guys who have profiled very, very well as run blockers throughout their time. And I don't know if Sean Payton is going to let Russ into the kitchen, because Russ, after Hackett got fired last year, looked absolutely incredible in everything that the Broncos had wanted when they gave up a haul to get him. But he loves throwing deep, and Mims is the ultimate deep threat. And the opportunity, if even if not immediate, should be there for Marvin Mims.